Ah, good morning again, guys. Good morning. If you do not know me, my name is Tom Heitz. I'm the pastor of the Shepherds Fellowship. Uh, if you don't know anything about us as a church, uh, we've been a church now for about 20 years here in Marion. Actually, it's a little over 20 years. Um, <clears throat> over on State Route 4, just uh, across the street from probably the biggest landmark that people know is the, uh, the BFW with the helicopter in front of it. It's almost directly across from that. And so uh, we are thrilled that you are here with us. We are in a particular season. It is, it is in the way, isn't it? And uh, it's probably better for the people at home. You won't supposed to agree with that. Anyway. Uh, but we, <clears throat> this is kind of reminiscent for some of us. For those of you who have been with us for a long time, I know Tommy and Lynn have been with us. We used to go to, in our early, early days, and I think on Labor Day and Memorial Day, we all camp out at, Delaware State Park, and we would do church there for the, the people out there. So it's kind of reminiscent of those days. I think it's when uh, Aiden was baby dedication. Yeah. And how old is yeah. Aiden now? 16. No, he'll be 16. No, we don't want to talk oh, about don't go there? It. He'll be 16 in a couple of months. Okay, he'll be 33 in no time left. Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> no. But, uh, so we love being out here. If you're just stumbling into this, we're in, uh, this month we're going to be in different parks around our community. Uh, next week we'll be Kenley Park over by the hospital. Then the week after that at Sawyer Park. And the week after that we're going to be uh, at Founders Park downtown here. And the reason we're doing this is uh, we just got down the last couple of years really focused on who the biblical Jesus is. And uh, not like just the Hallmark Jesus or the kid story Jesus or it seems to me Jesus, but who Jesus truly is and how he trained disciples and, has, and such, how we should be trained up and how we can train other people as well, reach people and train, train people for Jesus. And we're in a transition phase uh, where we're moving kind of out of the Gospels into the Acts and we're, we're, it's going into action. Not that we haven't done anything for 20 years, for, be it, but for our studies, uh, it's going to be more about taking it out into the community. And so we decided we just want to get out of this community. So that's where we're at today. Uh, we have gone through Acts chapter 1 already. Uh, we're, it was kind of the not yet season. We had where Jesus has uh, died, had come, he died, he resurrected. Uh, Shannon, you look like you can't hear me. Can you hear Is it, everything okay out there? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, sweet. Uh, it's very quiet. But the, yeah. so Jesus came, he lived, he died, he was resurrected. And we spent this time on these 40 days that he spent on earth after his resurrection, appearing to over 500 people, people who would still be very much alive during this season. Uh, and then he ascended back into heaven. He gives them that the great commission to take and lead people to Jesus, to baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and to teach each other, each of the disciples, to obey everything commanded of us because he wants the best for us. And so then after that 40 days, he sent back into heaven. This is where we picked it up last week, where they are told you have a massive mission to do this uh, through the power of the Holy Spirit, with the authority of Jesus Christ, to your hometown, Jerusalem, to your country, Judea, uh, to the uh, people who are different than you, the Samaritans, uh, getting past the racism and the prejudice, and uh, also to all the ends of the earth. And then Jesus is sent back into heaven and they're sitting there staring up in the sky trying to figure out what they're supposed to do next. How do you handle this? There's about 120 people at that time. And the angels, a couple of angels show up and say, why are you still looking up in the heavens? Go wait. So that's what they did. That's what we studied last week was in Acts chapter 1. Of them dedicating themselves to unity, prayer, stewardship, service, getting ready up and running. Today we're going to go to the next section of it. So if you have your Bibles with you, go ahead and go to Acts chapter 2, which is where we're going to be going today, uh, to pick up on that particular testimony. If we do not have, usually when you're in our church, we have Bibles under the uh, chairs and baskets. If you have those Bibles still, we don't have those out here, but we still have you version up and running. So if you are using your uh, app on your phone with your signal, you can go to you version. It's the number one national free Bible app. And you can search it local live events there, and you see TSF for today's date, so we'll give you all the scriptures, place to take notes, prayer requests, whatever you'd like, uh, you can get that set up. But I'm always kind of good, old school, open up the Bible, dig in, type, post 
So Acts chapter 2 is we're going to pick things up again. This is after 10 days of them getting ready for whatever this is. They just know the Holy Spirit's going to show up in a unique way. They don't know uh, what that means. So they, they've been just doing what they can as they lean in. And what I like to do, if you've not been here before, I like to read a little and talk a little. In a couple of sections, we're going to read a lot and talk a little. Uh, but as we always say, whatever's in the scripture you're stuck with, whatever my commentary is, take back to the scripture that I decide what you want to do with it. But the, uh, oh, another thing I'd love you to know about me, the wrong question, I have a massive sinus attack right now, so I'm going to sniffle like mad. I'm sorry if that didn't miss you. It was a real good shot and stuff. And I'm also very jacked up on nightfall. So I don't know if you guys are actually here or not, but I see people, so I'm just going to go with it. Okay, so, anyways. Let's start reading and see what we find. But this is where we're going to see the church really coming from that uncertainty aspect of the not yet seen into power. This is when the church first is born into power. So it says in verse 1, When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind that filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all, were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So starting out, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about a couple of the, uh, the big festival holidays that the Jewish people had that always commemorated something, always stood for something. Uh, Passover is one of those. If you've not heard of Passover before, uh, I love Passover. Uh, I've shared it before. Arguably, it's probably my favorite spiritual holiday. It is not today. It is in two weeks. May 19th is when we celebrate Passover this year. Uh, so we're a little bit ahead of the game on it this, this particular year. But Pentecost is not something that just started here in Acts 2. It's not something that uh, just Tom made up because he likes it. It is something that's been in place yearly since back in the days of Moses. Uh, it is a celebration of the anniversary of when God gave Moses the tablets of the Old Testament, of the Old Covenant, I should say, uh, of, the, of the law, to where they, the Jewish people became his people. He became their God. Uh, and so every year they would celebrate it. It was always 50 days after Passover. So Passover was when they would celebrate when uh, God told the Israelites when they were stuck in Egypt, the plague is going on, the last plague, the angel of death was going over the households, and the first uh, bone of every household, would, would, the firstborn son would die. Uh, it told the Israelites, mark your dual frames with the blood of the lamb, and the, the angel of death would fly over you, the Passover. And so they always celebrated each year, that Passover uh, meal as well, in celebration of God's faithfulness to them. Uh, here's the thing that just, I think is awesome. Uh, I love God's timing. I love the fact that God's been in control since the very beginning. Uh, Passover is when Jesus was born, right? I mean, that's the Passover meal that was the Last Supper. It was Passover. It was when he was taken. He was falsely accused. He was uh, the monkey trials, the abuse, the death, and the resurrection were all about Passover. When we can accept Jesus, his blood, to cover our sins so that we do not die in our sins. I mean, Jesus, he, God had that in play that entire time, for generations. Forty days after Jesus ascended, right? He said they hung out with people, appeared to over 500 people. How many days were they in devotion to prayer and they're getting ready for whatever this thing was? How many days? You're not that far away, I can still see you, 10, right? So 50 days later, what happens? Passover. <coughs> Passover is when they were celebrating this relationship with their God and the, the, the basis of this old covenant. Another thing that's really kind of cool about Passover is that there's multiple elements to Passover that really interplays into the relationship we have with God and the church. Uh, one, it was the festival of harvest, which we were empowered by God to be able to do his mission to, to bring a great harvest within this world of people that need Jesus. Uh, it was the most uh, inclusive of the festivals. Everybody, no matter what the social status, were on the same level at this particular festival. Well, God's message is for everybody. Uh, it, it was, I don't want to look at my notes. I don't know how to be all, all known. Uh, community, again, all social classes. 
acceptance. Acceptance was a big one, but this one because the, the bread that you use for this particular uh, this particular festival was the common bread. In other words, everybody had it, everybody could make it. It was a very common place. <coughs> and again, it was absolutely made for the celebration of God's faithfulness. And here we are celebrating God's faithfulness with the Holy Spirit given to us another way. So <coughs> all these generations, God had this plan. God had this plan for this particular holiday. The other thing to go about this holiday is because of it, there's a lot of people in town. Everybody comes to Jerusalem because of these particular festivals. So we have this uh, coming up in this place as well. So this is, Pentecost is huge, uh, and it is announced when the Holy Spirit comes in two different ways, fire and wind. Now with the fire, and again, the symbolism of glory, is also because fire is uh, pure, purifying, it's, uh, it's all consuming, it's warmth, it's light, so we have those elements to the Holy Spirit and the mission that he's calling us to. The wind itself, uh, when we look at the original language, like the, the New Testament, you're mostly looking at Greek and Aramaic, those original language. Uh, in the Greek that is used here is defined as a mighty wind to the point of a tornado. Or, uh, <coughs> I know no, a second ago it could be annoying that we had this train going by, but it's actually a good thing in my head because it's, it's the same intensity of being beside a train as it's going by you and you're only about a foot away from it is the type of intensity that this particular uh, wind had and the power that was behind the Holy Spirit that was residing within us. And then even uh, beyond that, when we look at the Hebrew word for it that they, that they partner with, we find the same word used when God breathed life into man. So I, I think, I don't know, maybe just me, but I always kind of picture like God with Adam, he kind of creates Adam, he goes... But like, according to the scripture, it was a, it, it, there's an intensity to life. There's an intensity to this power that was being displayed within these these symbols that came over them, which obviously would completely and totally uh, weird them out and just be overwhelming, I would think. So here, this is where we see them moving into power instead of just from the uncertainty. Now, if we pick up in verse 5, and again, keep in mind that we're reading these from the standpoint of not just educated biblical imagination, where, like, what would that look like, but uh, also what does this mean to us today, fulfilled by the Holy Spirit as well. So now that this has happened, now the Holy Spirit has resided within us, we pick up the power moving into the city. And that's really where we're going to be at for the next few weeks, is, if you remember again, for them to take it to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and all the rest of the earth, we're going to be looking mostly at Jerusalem. There, there is a other elements within us, but mostly the power of the, in the city, and that's why we're in the city. So, verse 5. Now, there was dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together, and they were bewildered, because each one was hearing them speak in their own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of them speaking in our own native languages? And then they speak a lot of different languages and take a list of a bunch of different languages that I cannot pronounce, and we're going to jump down to 11. To both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others mocking said they are filled with new wine. So one of the things we're going to see pretty quick in this is that when we start seeing the power moving into the city and we start seeing the, the church worshiping from that that it's going to be like something they've never imagined before. I had a, a new friend of mine uh, and I've been at this several times but a new friend of mine who happens to be with him like what, what are my five year goals and I don't have five year goals I, 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 don't, I don't understand uh, I, I was raised in the business world before I got into the ministry I understand it's a big part of it uh, but I think God kind of struggles with me anytime I come up with a five-year plan because uh, he always has zigs and zags and things that I have no clue what it is. It's just, uh, I, I told her my prayer is that God gives me enough to be able to lead on the church and outside of that, uh, for it to help me be faithful and then he can take care of everything else. And I, I think it would be kind of like that with these guys as far as like, what does all this mean if this 120 group is going to reach the entire world with this incredible message, and the Holy Spirit's going to show up, we don't know what it is, that this is very different than what they thought it was going to be, but they were open to responding to what God wanted it to be, if that makes sense. And so uh, here they are, they're going out, and they're, they're testifying, 
into this this great crowd of all the people that from all over. Now, the big thing to notice here, this is why I say we see uh, we see aspects of the Great Commission on the Law is because because of God's timing, because of God's way, because of the way He handled it, the message is now going to go out to every corner of the earth. Did you, did you see that? It's Jews from every nation under the earth. Everything that they knew at that time, people were there. And they were going to go back to their hometowns after this festival, and they are going to tell everybody about what they saw. But for the disciples, they're still focusing on Jerusalem with this first talk that they had. And so they had this miraculous event happen where they're speaking, kind of speaking in other tongues. <coughs> the main thing is that they're not speaking in tongues. This is not the prayer language. <coughs> this is not the Holy Spirit's language. <coughs> this is the Holy Spirit translation. They are speaking Galilee. But everybody is listening and hearing them in their own tongue. Does that make sense? So like if I'm was up here speaking in English and worship pastor Mike only knew how to speak in French but he was understanding what I was saying with his French is. Uh, I'm not speaking French, that's just the way that the Holy Spirit was translating for everybody that was there. It's uh, unique in the scripture, we don't see it in any place else. Some look at it as the reversal of the Tower of Babel, if you're familiar with that story at all. Where, uh, it's actually, <laughs> if, you, if you read it, I think it's kind of an interesting uh, note in there. But it's, it's back in the Old Testament from Genesis, and mankind gets together, and they decide they're going to build this tower to, to heaven. They're going to reach God uh, by making this tower, and they get to work on it, and they, they do pretty good with it. And uh, it gets to a point that um, God looks down and says, my gosh, look what they could do when they actually work together. And I think it's funny because it wasn't as real for them to build this tower. We're about to find out he's going to stifle it. It's not going to happen. But, but he's like, my gosh, look at it. It's kind of like, to me, and maybe this is horrible. This is why you don't have to take the commentary stuff if you don't want it. Uh, if my kid shoplifted gum from a, a store in a very creative way, and I was like, that was pretty smart. I'm not going to let him sell the gum, but my gosh, look what that boy can do when he puts his mind. You know what I mean? It's like, like he, was, he, was kind of a, he was kind of impressed with that, even though we're goof, goofs, that we can still do the things that we were doing. And so... Uh, that, that's when he threw them all in these different languages. I know, it's a good, it's cool. It's good. Uh, but the, uh, but he, he brought confusion. That's where Babel comes from, with all the different languages. This is the reversal of that. This message is for everybody. He wants everyone, everyone to know. So that's where those messages are coming into play. And so, you got to decide what you're going to do with that. You got to decide what some, some really leaned into it, wanted to hear more. Some said they just uh, ignore them as well. Uh, if you've been around for a while, I'll preach on uh, this, this chapter often enough that you know what I'm going to say next. Uh, it is amazing to me how good we are at trying to explain the miracles of God if we don't want to receive them. If, if I'm speak, if you guys like for the United Nations and I speak in English and you all hear me in your language, uh, the dumbest. It, explanation to that is, well, Tom must be drunk. You know what I mean? Like, it, it makes no, no sense. They, they're speaking a different language. We we'll understand all languages, so they must be drunk. Uh, doesn't make any sense whatsoever, but we tend to excuse away the things of God that we don't want to accept. Uh, ironically, especially with this translation, I use the ESV for primarily for preaching. Um, they got it right. These guys are filled with new wine, but they're not drunk. They're not drunk. So some are trying to explain it away, some are trying to lean into it. And then we see when, when the church is worshiping, then the, the, that mission, uh, that church starts moving through that power into the mission and into the world. So this is where we're going to pick up the message. Uh, as we read, I think, I believe this is the longest recorded message that we have of Peter uh, that he gave. So here, again, put yourself in that chaos. No one really knows what's going on. Verse 14, Peter stands up with the eleven, and he lifts up his voice, and he dresses them. And again, lift up his voice means he's being bold, and he dresses them. Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day, which would be 9 a.m. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. In the last days it shall be, God declared, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and on your sons and on your daughters shall prophesy, and the young men shall shoot visions, and your old men shall see shall dream dreams. 
even on my male servants and female servants, in those days I'll pour out my spirit and they will prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood, but the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst. As you yourself know, this Jesus de uh, delivered up according to the definite plan and for knowledge of God, was crucified and was killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, losing the pangs of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David said concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart shall be glad, or was glad, and my tongue rejoiced, and my flesh also will dwell in hope. For you would not be abandoned, my soul, to Hades, or let my, your holy one see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life, and you will make me, uh, make me full of gladness with your presence. So with this, I'm going to stop there for just a second. This is halfway through, and maybe even most of the way through uh, Peter's <laughs> talk. The, the big wow at this moment, if you have got a float of us, you don't. You don't. You don't. Okay. Uh, that apologize. The, uh, the thing that's the big wow in this moment, I mean, obviously, the, everything you said about Jesus is a big wow. But if you could picture yourself, especially with the cross mix of people that are here that have been hanging out for the last couple of months for these holidays, uh, Peter has had a dramatic change in his life. Dramatic change in his life. Less than two months before this, he messed up big time. You guys know what I'm talking about? I hate that you guys are so far away from me because I, I feel like I can't ask questions. What did he do? What, what, what's he been struggling with? Did I crash three times? Absolutely. And where did he do that? This courtyard. There's three times in the synagogue courtyard that he denied knowing Christ to the point that he cursed about it. When he was sitting there at and they're, they're like, we know you were Jesus, we know you Jesus. I'll tell you, in love with that guy. I mean, they're just like, he's coasting at it. And ever since Jesus has come back to life, there's been these different testimonies of him being restored by Christ. And then he goes from, I don't know what this looks like, we've got to get ready, guys, to standing up and speaking up boldly and saying, look, this is what you need to know. And as we continue the text, you're going to notice he gets experienced for him. He says, you killed him. You killed him. And there's times that, and again, keeping in mind that no one who is alive at that time is alive now, that can testify. But the time that this book went out, there was many people who were there those days that know whether or not this happened or not. And there's evidence to the validity of that for that reason. There's tons of evidence in the scripture. If you go to a court trial, they're going to give you all kinds of evidence. And you and I might think differently of what the result is. But one of us is right and one of us is wrong. There's all kinds of evidence in the scripture. These people saw him go from a weakling, over-the-top denier to saying, I need to tell you something. And that's evidence of the, of the resurrection of Christ, but also of the power of the Holy Spirit that you and I can have as well. And so there's a big round moment in there. And then he goes through again the scripture. I love that he goes back to the scripture. He's talking about the prophecy of Joel. He's talking about the prophecy of David, which he continues in verse 29. He said, Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about this patriarch David, that he was both died and was buried, and his tomb is still with us today. Being uh, therefore a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would, would set one of his descendants on the throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out, all, poured out this that you yourselves have seen and hearing. For David did not ascend into heaven, but he himself said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand, until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus, who you 
crucified. Look at the bonus that he has there and the things that we need to know just as much as they needed to know at that time. Uh, Jesus was approved by God. Jesus was approved by God. He is the Messiah. He just, um, his destiny was to die on that cross. The, the whole thing with, with, with talking about the one coming is this death is the scripture tells us that we have all sinned fallen short of the glory of God, right? You guys are with me on that. And that the penalty of sin is death. Is everybody with me on that? That's what Romans tells us. And so that death had to be paid. It's either my spiritual death or Jesus' death on the cross. And he's the one that took the hit even though he didn't deserve it. That was the destiny. That was what God, God had. So he was here, the same here. So God raised him from the dead. And Jesus is exalted at the right hand of God. He's telling them everything that had happened up to this point. Now, what's interesting is when we go now from that mission to the response to that mission. What is their response to that message? And I love this aspect of things. Verse 37. When they heard this, they were cut to the heart. I wish everybody who knew the truth about Jesus Christ would cut to the heart by it. Some of us, I think, even accept it and were not cut to the heart by it. But when they heard, they were cut to the heart and said to, the Peter, to said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And as a pastor, I talk to pastors in the community. I talk to pastors outside our community, all kinds of different ways over the last several years. And there, there are different things we talk about that most people probably don't care about. But one of them is about like, how to get into service. And we have, we have a response time. Our response time looks different each week a little bit, um, depending on what the Spirit's doing that day, what that message is. But like, do you have a response time? Do you not have a response time? Do you have an invitation? Do you not have an invitation? Uh, none of that was considered in Acts chapter 2 in any way, shape, or form because they did not have a moment to even set that up. They heard the message. They were cut to the heart and said, what are we doing? What do I do with this? That's pure. That's pure and honest. And it, it's awesome if we can get ourselves to that place. I really believe so. So they say to them, what, what do we do? And Peter said to them, the gospel. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sin. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, just like they had. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off. Who's that? You and me. All those who are far off. Everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So that those who oh sorry, so those who received his word were baptized, and they were added to that day about three thousand souls. So no invitation whatsoever straight to the gospel. If you want to know how to respond to Jesus Christ, it's just as simple as what Peter said. Accept him as leave forgiven your life. If you've not done that, you can do that today, right now, in this moment. I do not need to shut up for that to happen. I don't need to sing a special song, we don't need to get candles out. We don't need a campfire moment. We don't need a lot of emotion. What we need is cut to the heart and say, what do I do with the message of God? I don't, even though I was in this boat earlier in my life, I still don't understand how I got to the point that I can say, well, yeah, there's a God, but that doesn't really change anything. If there's a God, I don't know how that doesn't change everything. And so if I cut the heart that Jesus died and rose for me and has a plan for me, has a purpose for me, has a relationship that I can be with him right, right now, how that would change everything. And so Peter's telling me, this is your response. You accept Jesus as leader for giving your life. Romans puts it like this. If you acknowledge with your mouth that he's the son of God, that Jesus is the son of God, if you believe in your heart, he died and rose again. And the way that I phrase it, if you say, you're God, I'm not, I'm following you, then you're saved. That, and he says, this is what you need. You need to be saved from this wicked generation. You need to be baptized, which is the fulfillment of that righteousness, as we see in the teachings for Jesus, where we can talk about it another time. And then we move into discipling one another, teaching each other to follow Christ so that we can be on the good side of things instead of the screwed up end of things. It's not that hard of a mission. It's not that hard of a goal. But the difference is that some people will hear that, and they will not be cut to the heart, and some will be cut to the heart and say, Jesus, I need you. Jesus, I need you. And if someone accepts Jesus as leader for giving him life, what we find in chapter 2 is that that continual progression of going from uncertainty to power, from power to mission, and the mission to the message, it should go into life change. It should go into a complete and total life change. And so I, in many ways, have just been built into this next section that we're about to read. This, this, this is the beauty of the gospel in Christian community. Okay, I'm not, I'm, 
uh, local body church at its best should be Christian community. We should be Christian community. Uh, everything up there is leaning up to this beautiful part that the world had never seen before and that we still struggle to see today. So, read this with me. I love this scripture. It's on that verse 42. This is what happened after that 3,000 souls came to the Lord. By the way, that's a pretty massive church in one month. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Okay? There were a multitude of things here. If you are not Scott Search and you don't mind writing in your Bible, you can highlight if you got your iPad. Okay? If, if you want to underline or highlight these words, do it in Scripture. I'm going to put extra emphasis on them. There's a ton of them. The result was they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. The way we do that is through the Scripture today. They devoted themselves to fellowship. Being together, not being a, a spiritual lone ranger. There's no such thing. I, I really, I don't, I don't think there should be in any way, shape, or form. All the scripture tells us we're supposed to be community and we're not good by ourselves. That started out in Genesis 2 with Adam and Eve and it never stops. So, they're devoted to the Bible teaching, fellowship. Uh, they were devoted to the breaking of bread and the praying, which we also saw in the 10 days. Uh, all came over every soul with the wonders and the signs that were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. There was a complete and total unity. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any way had need. If you had excess, you got rid of it, and you helped somebody who was going through struggles. That was a, that was a common place. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes. Okay, so day by day, they were together, both in the temple and their homes. The, there's an important point here that I would die on. Uh, we were made for, for lack of a better term, organized worship, and we're also made for relational worship. They, they met in the synagogue, and they met in each other's homes to be able to do these things together. Here's the reason I say that. There's um, uh, people that have said to me, some usually with great pride and almost with a little bit of judgment, I, I mean, I, I go to a home church because that's the way the only church did it. Uh, that's not factual. Here, we met in the synagogues and in each other's homes. We were made for both. They went to home church only when they were being threatened with death and they missed the organized. They missed the synagogue. I believe we are made for both. Both have benefits that balance each other. Um, and if you forget the fact that they missed the benefits of, of the other side, then you're missing a big point. So Christian community is larger than Sunday morning and it's larger than playing golf with another Christian buddy instead of going to church. Okay. So, uh, 46, they were in the temple and breaking bread together. They received the food with glad and generous hearts. Uh, so when we have the cookout, we'll be watching you on that. Um, praising God and having favor with all the people. That's all the people that's not with each other. Okay, so they had, they had favor with everybody within the community. And the Lord added to the number day by day those who were being saved. So that 3,000 just kept adding and adding. And why wouldn't they? To see that kind of life change, to see that kind of power that comes with the Holy Spirit, see what kind of life changes when Christians are the real deal instead of being hypocritical about it or just kind of sipping the toe in every once in a while or just go, show it up at Christmas and Easter. Why wouldn't it change everything if it changed all of us? That's really what we're talking about. If we're going to go out into the community, we have to be the ones doing it and we have to let it be the Holy Spirit that's driving it, filling it, and showing us how to do it. Does that make sense? It's, it's, we work a lot, if, you, if you're not doing that fellowship, we work a lot for people that hope by church or hope by pastors before. Uh, and unfortunately, that's a very large demographic, very large demographic. And I get it, I've been there myself. I, I've gone through it twice on a pretty uh, big level, uh, maybe three. But uh, sometimes it was my own fault, sometimes it was the church's fault, one time it was the pastor's fault. Uh, it's easy to find those stories. So it's easy to see how people see the church, at least in the United States, and not want a whole heck of a lot to do with it, or to boil it down to just Sunday morning, because we boiled it down to Sunday morning, uh, or to, to boil it down to no life change, because we boiled it down to no life change. We try to be a little bit nicer, with a little bit of pixie dust blessing, sprinkle it on our life because God loves us, and that's it. And we're not doing the mission at, at this point. And we're not only not doing the mission, and I'm, not, I'm talking generally because some of you guys are killing it, but 
if we're not leaning to the power of the Holy Spirit, living by the power of the Holy Spirit, presenting the message of the Holy Spirit, then there is no way that we can get back to being that kind of church that people say, I want to be a part of that. I mean, I do want to be a part of this. No matter what my past experience is, if you, can, you show me a place that does this, I'm in. I'm in, and that's why we focus so hard on it at our church, is because we're trying in our little efforts and by prayer and by the power of the Holy Spirit to do what he calls us to do as individuals and as a whole. And it's important that we do so. One of the prophecies that they talked about when Peter was going off, it was the prophecy of Joel. And in the prophecy of Joel, uh, it was talking about uh, in the last days. And you'll notice a lot in the early church, they talk about the last days and that we're in the last days. Uh, and from our understanding, that's interesting. Because for them at that time, there, there are things within church history that make it appear that some of them took what Jesus said in the last days, that he was going to come back while they were still alive. Like the last days, like, okay, we got like three years to tie this sucker up type, type feel. Um, but Jesus never said that. The only thing he told us, it wasn't a hunt for us to know. That we know the seasons. And I know that if we go by human logic, being in this 2,000 years of Jesus in the New Testament and the New Covenant, so 4,000 years of the old, old, then that still makes sense to me logically. Okay, we're in the last days, we're in the days of Jesus, we're in the days of the church. But if I know the seasons, I'm telling you, we're either going to see the rapture or God's going to spank us. One of the two. It's, it's one of the two. He, and it's not up to me which one it's going to be. But if these are the last days, then we're going to see ordinary people filled with the Holy Spirit. Is that not what the prophecy said? We're going to see ordinary people, guys, ladies, rich, poor, whatever we want to use, misfits, the Lord. We'll be having dreams, prophecies, boldness, visions, miracles. And whether or not we ever get back to Acts 2, 42 through 49, I think it is. If I'm wrong, don't say anything. I like feeling like I'm right in the moment. We sure can shoot for it. And if these are the last days, it seems like these are the days we, we go for. So we're going to continue talking about the power of Jerusalem. You're going to find that it took the disciples a little bit of a kick in the butt to actually go to Judea. 